you know, in film, it's a director's medium. It's his vision. You know, the, the writer can write beautiful words and set up a beautiful sort of story. And, and yet it finally is the director who is taking the material, the performances, the crew's technical expertise, and he's molding it into, you know, a vision. Ron realizes the buck finally stops with the director. Um, and Ron has a wonderful way of getting great performances out of actors. How did you charm Betty Davis? <laughs> she was hard to charm. That was an important step for me. Anson Williams came up with that idea for that project. It was called Skyward. Um, it was about a, a, a paraplegic girl who dreamed of flying. And uh, Betty Davis was going to play this sort of crusty, aerobatic pilot who would eventually be her instructor and, and give her this opportunity to soar. And I had some disagreements with her about the character, and, and I was having to, you know, over the phone, sort of tell her, here's who I was going to cast, and here's, here's how I thought the character should look. And there were, it was some back and forth that was kind of tense. And she kept calling me Mr. Howard. And I, uh, I said, well, Miss Davis, uh, you know, just feel free to call me Ron, please. And she said, no, I will call you Mr. Howard until I decide whether I like you or not, and hung up the phone. So now I've never worked with a superstar at this point. I've worked with friends and family and people my age and peers and people who just felt lucky to have the job, you know, on the, on the movies that I'd done up to that point. And I was tossing and turning and it was my dad who said, you know, just don't be afraid to direct her because she's, she's a major talent. She's a multiple Oscar winner. She knows she needs direction. Every good actor knows they need leadership. So, you know, don't get in her way, but respect her process, but do your job. And so on that very first day, we were shooting in Texas, Plano, Texas, in August. It was like hit, hitting 100 degrees by, you know, 8 a.m. in the morning. We were shooting out on this airfield, and uh, I knew that William Wyler was her favorite director great director, but he always directed in a suit and a tie. So I showed up <laughs> in a suit and a tie. Uh, and uh, I went up to give her her first direction and she really overreacted in this big Betty Davis way. She said, oh, you startled me. I saw this child walking up to me and I wondered, you know, what, what, what of any consequence could this child possibly have to say to me? Ha 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 ha, does the big Betty Davis laugh. All of this is loud enough for the crew to hear. And so I did, uh, I laughed too and gave her the direction anyway and walked off and was popping tums and just thought, oh man, this is gonna be a long, a long <laughs> one. It's gonna be a long road. Now it's about 4.30 or 5. And I said, well, Miss Davis, you're, you're finished for today. We have another scene to do, but uh, great first day. Uh, see you tomorrow. She said, okay, Ron, see you tomorrow. And then she patted me on the ass. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, I, okay, <laughs> we're on the Betty Davis ride, uh, but I'd won her over. Didn't mean that uh, there weren't arguments and tense moments ahead, but when it was all over, she said, uh, keep it up, you could be another Weiler. I haven't turned out to be as great as Weiler. Uh, he's in the ultra elite, uh, but it certainly gave me a lot of confidence. What about Jim Carrey and the contact lenses on the Grinch? I felt like I was, it was the Spanish Inquisition and I was the Inquisitor. I could tell that the costume and, uh, you know, especially uh, the contact lenses were just tormenting Jim. I mean, he was having panic attacks uh, to the point where, you know, literally he'd be breathing into a paper bag in between setups, just trying to hang on because he just, he felt claustrophobic in the costume, but we'd already filmed it. He wanted to wear that costume. He wanted to create that character. I tried to do things just to cheer him up. You know, like, like uh, one day I put on the Grinch suit <laughs> so that I could suffer along with him and, and I could let him know just, yeah, I could see now how miserable it really was. Was and, it that bad? Uh, yeah, it was terrible. It was okay. itchy. It was, you know, and I didn't even have to have the contact lenses, mm. which made it worse. So he appreciated that I was at least willing to suffer with him. One day I surprised him. He loved Don Knotts. Don Knotts played Barney on The Andy Griffith Show. And I hadn't seen Don in a long time. But I called Don and I said, would you come over 
and hang out on the set one day, Jim Carrey idolizes you and he's going through hell on this project. And so I snuck Don in and I threw the speaker, I said, uh, hey Jim, look over here, look, look at me. Um, there's somebody down here who wants to see you. And he looked and he squinted through those contact lenses and he could see it was Don Knotts. And I wish I'd had the camera rolling because he immediately went into his Don Knotts impression. Jim's a genius impressionist. And he did a perfect Don Knotts in the Grinch costume. The whole crew was just laughing. He came down and spent an hour hanging out with, with, uh, with Don and it really elevated him. But I also, you know, I also understood the kind of agony he was going through and, you know, whatever he had to do, he'd have to do. Robert De Niro, you said he's not a guy who invented, he was reflective. Uh, how did that impact your future process? Well, I directed Robert De Niro in Backdraft. I wanted to sort of recreate that, the whole cowboy mentality and the environment around the Chicago Fire Department, which was unique in that, in that, at, that at that time, in a lot of ways, very old school. Robert De Niro came in to do a role. It was only four weeks of shooting. He could have phoned this in, but instead he really doubled down on his own research as this sort of forensic fire investigator. And once we started rolling, I realized that he had met three different fire investigators and now he had, he had the body language of one of them the speech cadence and, of another and, and the sort of the cocky attitude uh, of, of a third. And I realized that these vivid characters that he had created um, so memorably were, were not coming from his imagination. They were coming from what he could observe and learn and then sort of meld and, you know, and share through you know, his instrument, him as an actor. It kind of blew my mind. And it taught me in a way how to, how to research. The next film was Apollo 13, which was all about accuracy and authenticity. And slowly but surely, I just began to find real joy and creativity, ingenuity through the research, through the fact finding, and then finding ways to use everything that I learned about drama and comedy for that matter, to sort of present these ideas to audiences in ways that could be really um, you know, compelling and entertaining, but rich with detail.